What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Stan Tamandel. Stan is a therapist and teacher who has more than 25 years experience working with elders around forgetfulness, dementia, and extremely withdrawn states. He's the author of three books on coma and Alzheimer's, and he works with his wife as a consultant and teacher in Victoria, B.C., as well as internationally via phone and Skype. So welcome to Madness Radio, Stan Tamandel. Well, thanks, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Now, this is a topic that we've done a little bit on Madness Radio, but I think it's a, a really something that isn't talked about enough in our society, just the way that we treat our elders, especially the difficult states that they get into, the forgetfulness states, the dementia states. And you've been working around these topics from a very, very innovative view that basically believes in the meaning and significance of what it is that people are, are going through. And I'm, I'm just really inspired to, to have you on the show today. My dad is getting on in years, and um, he's facing some of these same issues. So it's also very personally significant to me. So thank you so much for being on the show. Well, well, it's interesting you mentioned your dad because that's how I really got deeply into this work was through my own father, who had uh, not early onset but started at about 69, going into states of forgetfulness, then died by the age of 79. And through my training and my own deep inner beliefs that someone is always home, that the essence of the person. Their deep spiritual core is always there. I just knew that I could do more with my dad than was, you know, standard practice in uh, veterans' nursing home that he was in. Fantastic nursing home, by the way. When he had to go into the nursing home, and my mom kept him at home for about two years too long. I think that's a common story. She was burned out. He had to go into a nursing home. He went into a big depression. Who wouldn't? I certainly would. And we had to work with that depression for, gosh, nine months before he started coming out of it. And then his, actually his, his dementia, his Alzheimer's, improved quite a bit after that initial depression. By working through the depression, you actually got some of the, some of the dementia symptoms would actually change and improve. That's right. There's, it, there's a real crossover between, between dementia and depression. I think it's something that we tend to use too many drugs and not, not enough psychotherapy with. That's my personal opinion anyway. As he went further into his progression of Alzheimer's, we were always able to connect with him. And I think this is really important, that the communication is always possible. And that one of people's biggest fears when they're inside in those withdrawn states, whether it's dementia or coma, is the fear of isolation because no one understands. We were able to work with that and because they always connect with him and have meaningful connections with him. I went to visit one time, and so this one particular time, he was fairly withdrawn, and he was had his fingers, and he was rubbing a sheet between his thumb and fingers. This is a fairly common perseveration for people in these states. And so I figured, well, there's a communication going on between the thumb and the fingers. So I stuck my hand in between his thumb and fingers, and what he was doing changed. So bingo, something's happening, I'm going to follow this. And as he did that, he started rubbing less, but exploring more and explored my hand and then up my arm a little bit, and then he backed down and then up my arm until he got to my upper arm. And I had the intuition that he was maybe wanting deeper contact with his son and wanted a hug. So I went right in and tried hugging him while he pulled back instantly. I was on the right track. It was too soon. So then he starts working my arm again. And after about three or four tries at this, me trying to hug too soon, he finally gets up to my shoulder, and then he discovers my hair, and then he starts stroking my head. And not in a way that was exploratory, but in a way it was deeply connecting and intimately touching. And then I went in for the hug, and we hugged. First hug we'd had since I was 12 years old, because, you know, men are in that generation don't hug after, you know, 10 or 12. And it was, uh, it was incredibly deep and meaningful for both of us. So you took this great belief that, you know, there is somebody home and he's trying to communicate that this perseveration that's happening, this motion that's happening with his fingers and thumbs, actually there's something meaningful in that, that he's actually 
someone you can relate to if you actually pay attention to and follow what it is that he's doing that is an effort to communicate. That he needed support or just something different introduced to have the communication go further. And so the situation with um, so many of our elders and people who are facing dementia and Alzheimer's, it's really there's an assumption that they, they are kind of lost to us, that they, they can't communicate, that relationship isn't really possible. I, I think it's all too common. And, you know, I would call it a nocebo attitude. And nocebo, if you translate it from the Latin, means to harm. But most people are familiar with the term placebo, which placebo means to please. And if we have an attitude to start with, that nobody's home or that it's not much use, or maybe they're trying to do something, but I can't understand, so I'm just going to do my daily care routine and get out of there as quick as possible. We had one chaplain say to us, well, actually several chaplains say that, you know, I used to go in, say my prayers, do a little scripture reading, and get out of there as quick as possible because it was uncomfortable for me. So 10 minutes max. And now they go in, and they just breathe with the person, sit with the person, notice everything that's coming from the person, every little twitch and movement and turn of the head, and report back and assume that that's, they're trying to communicate something. And now they're happy to spend a you know, half hour to an hour with people. Now, Stan, I know a little bit just from my own experience with my father and also my, my grandfather about what, what it is that we're talking about, these states of dementia, these states of forgetfulness and, and Alzheimer's. Can you tell us like what are the kinds of things that people start to do? People start to lose contact with what we call reality. They're not able to sort of take care of themselves. And what is it that really happens that's so common that you're addressing from this, this different perspective? It's complicated, Will, because here's my dad who's slowly losing his memory and he's living at home. And I went to visit one time, and we were playing cards around, you know, the dining room table like we've done as a family for, you know, forever. And my dad can't quite get the cards straight, or he doesn't get it fast enough like he used to. He used to be like one of the best poker players I've ever seen. And then my mom, bless her heart, starts correcting him, thinking that she's helping, which the intention is right. But he feels criticized, and he actually does worse, just like probably you or I would when we feel criticized, and goes away a little further. And this way he gets a little worse at playing cards. And then she tries to help him some more. So it, it's an escalating, it's like a double bind. It's like if he tries, he's going to get criticized. If he doesn't try, he'll get criticized more. So what does he do? He withdraws. I tried to talk to my mom about this. My brother tried. She just couldn't get it. So you're describing a situation where there's, say, a biological um, condition, which is maybe the aging process um, causes a certain kind of forgetfulness. And then, in addition to that, there are the relationships and the context that kind of feed into it and then make it worse. So then, But then people are only looking at this biological disease aspect. They're not looking at the way in which the communication or the relationship or the, the way that people are approaching the person is actually contributing to and making worse. And is that a, a pretty common dynamic that you see, that, that there's an overlooking of the context and how it could be playing into what it is that someone's going through, that just the whole thing is blamed on dementia and Alzheimer's? Almost everybody has the best intentions. Well, gee, Grandma, my boyfriend really didn't steal your rings. You know, mm-hmm. But Grandma thinks that the boyfriend stole her rings. And, and the granddaughter can tell Grandma 20 or 30 times that, and it doesn't have any effect. And this is what we call, it's, it's a little bit ironic, this is what we call two people have forgetfulness. Because the granddaughter forgets what she has said hasn't worked for the last 20 times. She's not taking the feedback because it's outside her system or her beliefs or doesn't know how to go beyond what we call the consensus reality, the so-called reality realm. In reality, the boyfriend didn't take grandma's rings, but at some level, the grandma thinks that this boyfriend is a thief. So then we'd have to look at things in a more symbolic or meaningful way and say, well, what is the boyfriend perhaps stealing from the grandma? Mm-hmm. Often, in the case, it has to do with relationship. The grandma is jealous because the boyfriend is now taking up the granddaughter's time and attention. But especially people 
people of that older generation can't bring these things out directly. So if as a helper you work out that symbolic meaning of the metaphorical communication that the person is making, that they're talking about the rings being stolen, but really they're talking about jealousy and feeling like they're losing their relationship with someone, how do you then engage with the situation to help it move forward? Well, one of the ways is to really try to get more direct and to bring it out into the open. My good friend and colleague, Tom Richards, his grandmother, who was 94, in a nursing home, going in and out of memory loss, a bit, not so, not so horrible. And his brother, Dick, came to town, and he hadn't seen his grandmother for about six years. And there was no way he was going to go visit his grandmother in a nursing home because I think it just scared him, actually. This is a, one of the things that's going to happen to many of us, and it's, for people that aren't used to it, it's not pleasant. So... Uh, last day Dick was in town, we took him out for breakfast and then strong-armed him into visiting his grandmother. And so Tom is on one side of the bed, I'm on the other side of the bed, and we're each holding Grandma's hands. Dick is against the far wall away at the end of the bed, all plastered against the wall and not saying anything. And we're having a good conversation with Grandma. And then once in a while, just out of the blue, so to speak, Tom's grandma would look into the air and say, Sonny, go down and stoke the fire. It's cold in here. And we'd, we'd be like, well, what the heck? You know? And it's because these places are usually about 87 degrees. You know? And so after about the 10th time, I'm racking my brain, thinking, oh, cold. And I said, Dick, come up here where I am and hold your grandmother's hand. And he did and that was the end of going down to stroke the fire. But just trying to get things more, it's just good, basic family system to work well. Beautiful. Stan, you said before when you were talking about your father that one of the first things that you did to help alleviate some of his dementia symptoms was to work on, work on his depression. How did you do that? Is that something that you see is, is common, that people who are struggling with forgetfulness and dementia and maybe are in a living in a nursing home, that, that there's a big depression that's also part of the picture? Yeah, one of the ways we did it was uh, we worked with his posture. It was a, a very kind of a typical depressed posture, but in, in, the, in the extreme, you know, shoulders hunched way over, head down, body bent forward, uh, walking, shuffling. So we got him up walking and got him in contact with his body. Dad, notice your body. Notice how your shoulders are hunched. Notice your head. We're with you. We're right, one on each side of him so we could support him. He was still ambulatory, but we wanted to make sure he was fine. <clears throat> and then at a certain point, I had my colleague Tom get angry with him and just say, my dad's name was also Stan, so we called him Stanley. And he said, Stanley, if you don't communicate with us, I'm going to, like, punch you in the nose. It sounds a little extreme, but uh, my dad had... He was used to physical stuff, so it was okay. And uh, he came out of his depression. He came out swinging, so to speak. He says, no, you're not, and started interacting with us. So for people who aren't familiar with uh, that kind of approach, what would you say that someone that says, well, isn't that kind of manipulative? You're just sort of lying to him or sort of play acting with him to get him to have a response. Isn't it kind of a manipulation approach? You know, that's a good question. I mean, this I'm glad you brought this up because we get this every seminar we teach, we get this. And I think that depends partly on, you know, your skill level when you're interacting with somebody is you figure out the best possible intervention. We knew there was a lot of anger there. We wanted to somehow try to bring it to the surface. It sounds a little extreme, but it worked really well. And the fact that it worked, that we go by feedback. And if we'd have tried that, say, even three times, and he wouldn't have changed, we'd have just dropped it. But since he reacted, then we've got something started that we can go for, further with, and we started having a relationship that was something beyond his depression, and that he could bring out his anger a little bit. There's no place to bring out anger or agitation or strong reactions, especially in nursing homes, Will. It's, it's really difficult. Up here in British Columbia, if you are in a nursing home and the slightest bit aggressive, you get a purple dot by your name, and it, it stays there forever. You might have one aggressive episode and live another 10 years, and you've still got the purple dot. 
Yeah, the parallels the, with the mental health system are very striking. I mean, that is something that happens. People get labeled as violent, and it just stays stays with you. And just going back to what you had said before, Stan, you also mentioned that your father was someone who was a very physically active kind of character, and so you felt comfortable with using that. The punching threat would just sort of fit with his personality in a sense. Is that right? That's right. It fit with his personality, and also fit with the fact that we were up and moving together. So using a, a movement threat, so to speak, fit in with what he was actually doing in the moment. If he had been laying in bed and hardly responsive, I uh, definitely wouldn't have used it. You mentioned something very important, Stan, which is that people are slightly angry, a little bit agitated, a little bit difficult to deal with, and then there's this huge reaction in wherever they're living, the nursing home or wherever it is. And I think this is really common that so many of our elders, people who are forgetful or facing dementia or Alzheimer's, get into a place where they are responded to with their anger or their assertiveness or their just unruliness or difficult to be with. I know my dad would sometimes just get surly and mean and angry at that, just verbally at the people working with him. And that's when they people get medicated. That's when people get the antipsychotic medications, and we're seeing a huge number of people who are even without any kind of diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar, or, but just to control their agitation. And I think we do need to acknowledge that, well, there's a reason why these medications are being used, because they do tranquilize people. What, what's your, your sense of that? Because, I mean, so many of us are just concerned about that that's not a good approach to keep people under control and keep their agitation under control by giving them dangerous antipsychotics, which often do shorten their lifespans and cause terrible side effects as well. Absolutely. I, I, you know, there's been a lot of great research done on this, especially in the UK, shorten their lifespans and somehow sometimes just very quickly kill them. I'll, I'll be blunt. Yeah, the research shows that. And of course, there's never been any testing done on elders because it's unethical. I mean, really. So the dosages are, by guess and by golly, usually they can only take maximum a half of a dose of what a, a normal, young, healthy adult could take. There's a, a fantastic study done in a Canadian nursing home in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and they realized that they were using too many psychotropic drugs, and, and everybody knows this. But what do you do about it? What are the alternatives? And so they hired a nurse full-time to do drug review. And this, this is a, a unit with about 280 beds. And there was 56% of the people were on some dosage of psychotropic medicine. And over a three-year period, she was able to reduce that to 6%. And people were happier the staff had an easier time caring for people because they were more alert, more functional, could do more on their own. And I think it's tragic. And I, I also commiserate with caregivers because they don't know what else to do. That's an incredible thing that that nurse was able to do, to be able to reduce the use of, of psychotropic medications from 56% to 3% in that nursing home. How did she do that? How was she able to... Um, get the medications reduced without still having the original problems of people being agitated or difficult to deal with or having behavioral problems? Well, the, the main thing she did was just very simple. She just did drug reviews on everybody then just went, you know, and tackled it, you know, about six people at a time. And then saying, well, this person was given this medication three years ago for this condition, for this agitation. Has that recurred? And staff would say, No. Then she'd say, well, let's cut it by half and see what happens. Still no recurrence. Let's, let's cut it out entirely and see what happens. But this is just no rocket science, no psychotherapy involved here, just by reviewing drugs and, and reducing medications and then going by feedback, I guess I'd put it again. It speaks to how entrenched our nursing home system has become in using tranquilizing drugs as just a matter of course. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, our dream is that that kind of review combined with the, the placebo attitude that something meaningful is happening and, you know, using psychotherapy, using whatever, art therapy, dance movement therapy, drama therapy, there's been a lot of good work done with all these things in nursing homes that people can express themselves, get more meaning out of their life, and 
keep growing until they die. For gosh sakes, Will, I'm just uh, I'm getting a little passionate here. Uh, I want to tell a story about a very famous artist in Canada, anyway, named George Wallace. Now he's he died about six years ago, and he taught at university for years. He did sculpture, painting. Those are his main mod- modalities. And we were actually teaching at a hospice on an island near here, and the emphasis they wanted to us to teach from was the whole forgetfulness and dementia, because about it's the third uh, most common disease in hospice right now is dementia of some form or another. So we were teaching over there, and this a local gallery heard about us, and she said, well, I'll keep my gallery open longer because I've got George Wallace's work here, and I think you'd be very interested. So we stopped by. She had his early work, which was a very dramatic social activist, had a lot of political messages in it. His middle work was about the same, but much more mature and deeper. And then his last work he did after he had dementia. He was starting to lose his memory, and so his wife and him went into an assisted living home, and he stopped doing his art. And then he got depressed and got more forgetful and then had to go into a nursing home and was separated from his wife, but he had, a, he had his own room. And he, people hadn't realized that he'd always worked in his own space, and in the assisted living, he did not have his own space. So much to the credit of the nurses' aides and the nurses in the nursing home, they gave him paper and pencil and just encouraged him. And he started drawing. And his first drawings in that so-called, even call it the, his dementia period, were almost childlike. But within a few months, he started drawing very similar images to his earlier stuff, but deeper, heart and soul connecting, more meaningful. I think the best work of his career. And he did that for about another three years before he passed on. Something had stripped a lot of his so-called reality away, a lot of his memory. But the essence of the deep artist in him was able to come through even clearer, in my viewpoint anyway. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and our guest today is Stan Tamandel. Stan is a therapist and teacher who has more than 25 years' experience working with elders around forgetfulness, dementia, and extremely withdrawn states. Stan, tell us about the whole dying process, because of course what's happening when we become older is that we're really we're preparing for the end of our lives, and I know that this is a very significant part of the work that you, that you do, and I'm also especially interested in the way in which these creative and also spiritual states can emerge as part of people's preparation and then, and then passing. We had a, a friend here in town that died recently, and he died of, he died of HIV AIDS. He had AIDS. And, uh, and he wanted no medications, no morphine, no painkillers, because he wanted to stay aware as he died. Then he went into altered states, and some of them, nearly extreme, but the family was able to handle it. The family was in total agreement. And the well-meaning people at hospice, of course, wanted to give him morphine, 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 or dilaudid, or, you know, some opiate. And he said no, and he died of an incredibly aware, sometimes very far out in altered states death, but he would come and go from these states, connect with his family, totally supported and loved. And after he died, the half a dozen or so caregivers that had come to his home, he died in his home, told the family that they were amazed and that it was the first unmedicated death they had ever witnessed. And when you say he was aware, what what do you mean? Do you mean he was connecting and communicating and reporting on what he was going through as well as being in these, these more altered states? That's right. And the family had a little bit of training to help him uh, be aware in those states. Oh, wow. He would say something like, oh, I'm seeing the ocean. And they, they would say, yeah, Dad, go ahead and look at the ocean. Wow, I'm right there with you. Rather than saying, well, you're in bed in our home, you know, and you're dying. And then he would come back after, after going internal or into that, that other altered state. He would come back, relate to his family and say, I love you and thank you and you know, I know I'm dying, and then, and then go on another journey and be supportive. 
we're going in and out of those. And, you know, it can look like um, people are so afraid of pain, and rightly so. Pain can be a horrible thing, and if, it's, if you have too much pain as you're dying or at any time, it's, it's not productive to, for anything. But I know my wife Anne was working with somebody in in the southeast states, and and the, the woman started quivering. She was very near death. She started quivering and raising her hands. And the daughter, who was sitting by the side of the bed, said, "Oh, she's in pain. I'll call the nurse." Anne said, "Well, just wait a minute. Does that look like pain? You know your mother really well." And she looked at the mother's face and said, "No, it doesn't look like pain." And Anne said, well, let's just go a little farther with your permission. So she helped her raise her hands and encouraged her just to, to experience what she was experiencing. And the mother went into an ecstatic state. And then Anne said, well, your mother, was she a spiritual person? And the daughter said, yes, incredibly spiritual. And then she said, well, well, encourage her, sing some hymns to her, and encourage her to really connect with her deep inner self. Jesus or you know, whatever her spirituality was. So what it looked like pain and might have gotten medicated was actually in a spiritual ecstatic state trying to happen. And I think that this happens all along the line, not just very close to death. I'm going to talk about delirium a little bit because that's actually mostly uh, what we work with when people, when people call us and they've got a relative or a friend in trouble. We're mostly working with delirious states. And that can come out of dementia, or it can come out of metabolic changes near death, when the body is going through all these wild <clears throat> chemical changes. So what do you mean by a delirious state? What would that look like from the outside? How does someone kind of go through that? Well, you know, it's, it's a little tricky because it could look like just a little bit more memory loss. It could look like they're delusional. It could look like they're having illusions. It could look like... They're going crazy, I'll just put it bluntly. But it's usually temporary. And there's two varieties. There's a very inward state of delirium that looks almost like coma or perhaps like catatonia. And people in these states need to be encouraged. They'll be they'll be, you know, their their hands might be on their chest, they might be collapsed a little bit, they're very internal, and they need encouragement to go in further. Yes, experience what you're experiencing. Really know that it'll show you the way and it's just right for you. And those states usually get ignored because because the caregivers will say, ah, they're finally peaceful. We aren't going to bother them. But our idea is if we can help people process those so-called hypo-delirious states, those very quiet inner states, that they will get what they need and then not come out and be so hyper delirious. And hyper delirious is, you know, arms flailing and yelling and screaming and thinking they're being attacked by people and on and on. But even if that happens, we want to encourage the process, keep people from hurting themselves or others, of course, but encourage, yes, there's something you're scared of. Know what it is. I'm here beside you. Mmm. Yeah, it's scary. Look at it if you can. Not too long. Mmm. I know one sweet story is that uh, Anne's mother's nursing home called Anne up uh, late at night one time and, and said, your mother, she thinks she's in Mexico. <laughs> Anne said, well, let me talk with her. So Anne talked to her. He said, Mom, you're in Mexico. And Anne's mother said, yes. Anne said, what's it like in Mexico? And her mother said, ah, oh, it's warm here. And everybody is so loving. And Anne said, that's fantastic. So then Anne took the clue, and she just started being really warm and loving her mother up. She just laid it on thick. Mom, I love you. You're the best mom in the world. I'm so glad to be with you. No, it's just all very true for Anne. And so she could say it genuinely. And then after a short time, her mother said, you know, I'm in Mexico, but it's rather strange because I bought all the pictures of, of my family, and they're on the wall. How did that happen? And Anne says, yeah, really, look at those pictures. How did they get there, Mom? She says, oh, yes, I'm in with my family in Mexico. And then Anne knew she was coming back to, you know, what we would call consensus reality and just helped her bridge that world by helping her be, by being loving and in Mexico and realizing that there was things in her hotel room that weren't in Mexico. And she finally came back to her nursing home room in Tennessee 
and we were talking to a caregiver later, and her, her mother had been over at a neighbor's, and they had watched this romantic movie about uh, love in Mexico. And so she wanted some of that, and so she went there. We could call her delusional. It was a temporary, very mild, delirious state. And then by going deeper into it, she was able to get what she really needed and then come back, come through. It was a journey to Mexico. Stan, I think so many of us want to really support our, our, our parents as they become older and really help them as, in the best way that we can. And at the same time, many of us have histories of, of abuse, maybe, or their family secrets, or maybe we've been treated very, very badly by our parents. Do you, do you see these processes playing out as people get older? Are there ways in which maybe some of that can get addressed and maybe even resolved, even if someone is starting to to go into states where they're having being forgetful or the beginnings of Alzheimer's states? I mean, what, what kinds of ideas would you have for helping people who want to relate to their parents more as they get older, but at the same time, there is this history of, of abuse that maybe has never been addressed? I don't mean to belittle it, but we work with it like we do with other abuse issues. And that is for the family member or members and for the person that's losing their memory, the so-called identified patient, uh, we work with it with slowness and care and extreme awareness. Which position is the person in in the moment? That is, are they more feeling more like the victim? Are they feeling more like a protector? Or are they feeling more like an abuser? And I think this is the root, unfortunately, of a lot of elder abuse. And people are even unconscious about it. I'll just be honest. They start, you know, sniping away at the elder's bank account. They've got a joint account. Or they'll just start putting them down. And a lot of it's very unconscious. Just it's that whole, it's a negative atmosphere in the house. Or... They'll just start even insulting them, telling them that they're crazy and that they unuseful things. And that, like I say, a lot of it's not aware. They're not aware of, and some of it they are aware of. But they're stuck in it, abusing their uh, their elder who abused them, the kid. And I think if you can bring some gentle awareness to that, that really really helps. Can you say a little bit more about how you would work with that? What would you bring to that that kind of dynamic? Let me tell this story. A woman who had been beaten by her father as a child, not often, but in a, in a very humiliating way. And when her father was about 86, I just encouraged her to bring it up directly. It's, it's in the atmosphere. You're thinking about it. Just try bringing it up directly with him. And she did. He did not remember. And so that's a really tough spot to be in because her intention was to clear up all these things before he got further into memory loss and then died. So on Fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which, it was actually up to her to work on that internally and in therapy. So that's, that's one of the things we can encourage. Sometimes the other person, they're like a mountain. They might erode slowly over time, but they are not going to change. That is just the fact of it. Then it's up to, up to me to work on myself and then how much contact, what type of contact, when and where and how do I want to have with this person, and what am I going to do about it. That's one way. Another way is to actually work with a sibling. I remember working with a woman who was agitated a lot, and so we went out for a walk with the son and the daughter-in-law, and Anne and I, and, and the mother, and we were walking around the block, and we actually had a a pretty good time all in all, but the troublesome behavior that they were worried about hadn't come up. So we went back into the nursing home, signed in at the front desk, and were turning to go to the elevator to go to her room, and she lashed out with a foot and kicked me in the shins. Bingo. Perfect. And then we, we didn't work with it right in the, in the lobby area. We went up into her room and then worked with it and say gosh, you have a strong kick. Something must be in there that you need to kick about. And, you know, we never got a lot of great verbalization from her, but her expression changed, her body changed. See, something was working inside of her. And 
didn't even work with, I, you know, I was tempted to work with the movement directly, but the movement was gone. I tried just gently pushing on her foot a little bit with my foot and was no go. But we got feedback years later. I mean, sometimes we don't get feedback until years later. That that one session helped change her whole attitude and it helped her really calm down and not be so aggressive. And <laughs> How do you think that she was, she was helped by that, just the way in which she validated and supported feelings that were behind the, the wanting to kick? That's right, and bringing some awareness to it. Because families in the system get frozen. You know, well, mom kicked out. Oh, she only did it once in the last two months. Well, we'll just ignore it. And they don't know what to do with it. It's a little scary. So that's our job is coming in from the outside as facilitators is just to bring things to awareness and help people be a little more direct about it. And if the family can't do it, we just do it for them. And watch, you know, I had one eye on the, the sons and daughter-in-laws feedback as I was doing this with the mother, and they were nodding their heads a tiny bit. So, uh, tricky work, and we often blow it. You know, try something three times, and if it doesn't work, just drop it, you know. So it's not giving up on the person and continuing to believe that a connection and communication is, is possible, and there is somebody home, and there's something meaningful happening here. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the whole thing that they've probably been isolated with this process for years or decades, maybe since their childhood, and to have it finally acknowledged, noticed, worked with even a tiny bit, it can be such a relief. You talked a little bit about pain and the dying process before. And what do you think of the whole question of choosing to die? The idea that in Oregon there's the a physician-assisted end-of-life process, people end their lives, suicide, assisted suicide, and that choice that people are, are sometimes want to make. And this has been very controversial in the disability rights community because of the concern that, well, if you have a society that says people are expendable and they're no longer productive and, you know, it doesn't mean anything to just be, you know, being in a nursing home, then of course you're going to start killing people or sanctioning or, or allowing them to be killed. And what, what are your thoughts about that? It's very tricky because, for instance, in every state that I know of, if someone is in a nursing home and they're, they're fading and you put a spoon up to their mouth with food on it and they open their mouth, you have to feed them. That's the law, because otherwise you are going to be starving them. And I have seen a lot of overweight people. I have seen a lot of people in, it's in horrible situations where they might have wished they were dead. I don't know for sure, but they're being fed. Some people, and actually most people, die by stopping eating and drinking. And it's actually a relatively good way to die because... When you do that, the endorphins kick in in your brain, and the pain isn't there, the thirst isn't there, the pain of hunger isn't there, and you go on amazing inner journeys. This is why people in the desert, as they were dying of thirst, would see mirages. Your mind is producing, you know, hopefully what you need to see in those, in those moments. And it usually takes about 10 or 15 days to die. And... There are some people that consciously choose that. But most people, when they are dying of thirst and starvation, uh, have, have long, long past the, the point of choice. And it goes into the deeper issue of, of our society. There's this point where instead of keeping people alive, we're not allowing them to die. And we do have like incredible medications and medical care now. And we're seeing in nursing homes where where a large percent of the population in the nursing home, certainly in my parents' generation, would have passed away from pneumonia, pulmonary disease, or heart disease, and they're being kept alive. And is it right? Is it not right? And then people that want to make that choice can do it in a lot of different ways. They don't have to move to Oregon or Washington. We had a 95-year-old friend of ours in uh, down east who was on heart medication, and then she was an artist, she had, but she was losing her vision, and she just gathered all her family around and said, on this date, I'm going to stop taking my heart medication, so please be with me. So after she stopped taking her heart medication, the family stayed with her about two weeks until she passed away. 
And what if that decision is part of being depressed or, or despair or an inner conflict, and maybe it's not the, the right decision, though? That's where I think uh, psychotherapists can come in and help, the, and family therapists, and help the person and the family work with the depression, work with the conflict, and uh, get as clear as possible. Just giving somebody an antidepressant and telling, telling them that they've got to live another 10 years it's probably going to make them more depressed. I don't know. Well, that certainly would me in that state of, I'd almost call it a zombie state. Excuse the word, but it's, it's that in between. I'm depressed enough I can't get out of it. I've got some medication that's helping me kind of stay relatively level, but I'm not really enjoying my life. I don't like my life even anymore. So what are they depressed about? What's behind it? What's going on? And I think this is where abuse issues can come up from the past or present. So I'm all for choice, and I'm all for working with people's deep emotional states, spiritual states, and their relationships. And what words of advice might you have for family members, for caretakers, for people who are maybe facing burnout? Because it can be so overwhelming when a parent or relative is at that place of forgetfulness and dementia and um, end of life, and it can be really um a recipe for just getting exhausted and, and, and burning out. What sort of words of advice would you have for them? Start getting relief early. Like I said, my mom's experience was she kept my dad at, at home, you know, for two years too long, and it almost did her in. There is at least some good daycare programs around, good respite programs around, and the people that have to go into them, some of them enjoy them, some of them kick and scream going into them, but it's just necessary to have for the caregivers to do it. If the caregiver doesn't take care of themselves, there's no care. So really, really doing that early, early on. And then really, this is where talking with other family members, friends about, well, when do I put dad into a nursing home? What do you think? You know, how do you think I'm doing? And family members can be relatively direct with you know, the main caregiver. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. There's just, you know, some caregivers just have to do it to the burnt out end. I've, I've seen that too often, but there's just no dissuading them. They love the person like crazy, and their, their life is for their life. So it's very touching and hard to deal with. So. And if the resources are there, is it often better to keep someone at home? Is that uh, usually a better solution than uh, a nursing home or institutional care? I, I think absolutely as much as possible. You know, the state of Arizona and the state of Vermont both now pay family caregivers uh, to keep, help keep people at home. And the wage, the wage isn't great, but it's something. You know, if, if, if let's say there's a couple and they need to care for their, one of their aging grandmothers and one of them's going to have to quit their job to do that, it might not work, you know. So I would, it's, a, it's a, a systemic problem that we need to really advocate for in our culture. And this, the Arizona and Vermont have both said they're, they plan to never build another nursing home. Uh, they're necessary. We've got to have them. But the more at home, the better. And sometimes you just can't, or you reach a place where you can't do it at home anymore. And to, to really hopefully get support to work with your own guilt about that, about not being able to do it. I, you know, this, I, I promise till death do us part, and now I'm putting my love into a nursing home. It's just it's really hard processing the grief, all the emotions that go with that, the dying process, and all the different steps along the way, you know, the step into assisted living, the step into the nursing home, the step into hospice, gets relatively little support in our, in our society. You know, we're talking about having to put people in, into nursing homes, and it's painful. One of the things that happened when Anne's mother had to go into a nursing home, and she was 2,000 miles away, is she, she contacted the University of Victoria, who uh, helped her, or co-invented with her, a visual Skype program that's extremely easy for elders to use. And so Anne connects with her mother by Skype, um, sometimes every day, sometimes more than once a day, and it has helped relieve the guilt and the isolation of both of them immensely. So if, if people are interested in that, they can go to University of Victoria and go uh, Google that and then CAN Connect, C-A-N-C-O-N-N-E-C-T. So that's, that's been an immense help. Also, 
the, the whole thing about connecting with our elders or people that are going into states of altered consciousness is it's very it's extremely difficult because of something we call the double state ethic or the two state ethic that is one day my mom is fine living at home and you know she can like remember to turn off the electric stove and you know turn off the water and all these things and then the next day uh, she's a little bit dreamy or a little bit out of it, and she doesn't always remember these things, or I don't trust her to remember these things, the, the kind of activities of daily living. And so I'm going to try to get her into a nursing home, and to help her do that, she needs information from both states of consciousness, both from her everyday, sure, I can live at home, look, I'm do fine. You know, I take out the garbage and I pick up the mail and I do these things. And from her dreamy state. So when she's in a more dreamy state, helping her work with the information that's in there. Say, Mom, you're like, you look a little dreamy and tired today. What's going on with you? And she would say something like, I just want to go back to my childhood home in Roseville, Michigan. Ah, let's go back to Roseville. What's back there? We just had fun. And and my one grandmother was nasty, but my other grandmother was really, really nice. I just mm. loved her. And so going into that state and then saying, well, Mom, you know, I'm not around here to love you enough, and this home is a lot to take care of. It might be better to just be able to be a kid once in a while. What do you think? So I'm trying to, set, you know, I'm trying to connect those two worlds of the one that can handle it and the one that just wants to be a kid. So helping connect those in her, you might not make the decision totally clear or easy, but almost for sure it's going to make it easier. We're getting information from both of her states of consciousness, or there might even be more than two to help her make that decision. We all have these things, actually, because I'll say, well, yes, you know, this house is too big for us, we've got to downsize and we're going to move to another house. And then that night I have a dream. And I dream that I'm in this house that's about three feet wide and two stories tall and there's no room to put all my junk. And so I need to take that information from the dream and from the fact that I just, you know, practically uh, we need to downsize, we can't afford the mortgage here get the information from both of those states to make the decision. Now, the decision hasn't been made yet, but just honoring both of those pieces of information as I go to make the decision. Stan, we are just about out of time for the interview. Give us some contact information, people who want to find out more about your work and how they can reach you, and also remind us again about the books that you've, that you've written and the work that you and your wife and Jacob are doing. There's one book called Coma Work and Palliative Care, which is really about end stages of life. And then there's another book called An Alzheimer's Surprise Party, New Communication Skills and Insights for Understanding and Relating to People with Dementia. And that's about my father's uh, later stages of going through the whole forgetfulness and Alzheimer's process. Another book is same title, An Alzheimer's Surprise Party, that says prequel. And both of these are available, all three of them are available actually, at the Process Work Institute of Portland or you can Google them online and find them online. And please email us, and that's at annstan, A-N-N-S-T-A-N, at coma communication, at C-O-M-A, and then communication all run together as one word, so annstan at comacommunication.com. Also, we have a website, www.comacommunication.com. It needs web gardening, but the, uh, the basic information on there uh, has been very useful for people over the years. Stan Tomondel, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Well, well, it's been a real pleasure. And, and uh... You've been listening to an interview with Stan Tomondel. Stan is a therapist and teacher who for the past 25 years has been working with elders on issues of forgetfulness, dementia, and extremely withdrawn states. He's the author of three books on coma and Alzheimer's, and works with his wife, Ann Jacob, as a consultant and teacher in Victoria, B.C., as well as internationally via phone and Skype. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. 
You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Listen on the internet at madnessradio.net and on iTunes. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.